thanks for having us and thanks for giving me the opportunity to t spend more time with Leanne Brown. I'm really excited that you asked me here today to speak with you because it's a topic um, that's not only incredibly timely and important at this moment in America for a lot of reasons, um, but is something that as a person who eats for a living, I think about every yeah. day and I think um, as someone who is lucky enough to eat well in this country, um, as we all are, and I know that I can say that because I just had lunch in yeah, the cafeteria. Right. <laughs> yeah, we know. Um, and I know how you all eat, um, uh, which is an incredible privilege, but sadly it has become a privilege. Yes. And um, I think I wanted to start there so that we can talk a little bit about how this book came to be because it is one of the most unique stories, certainly in cookbook publishing <laughs> of the last decade. I mean, yeah. it really was um, born in a way that I think could have only happened at this moment in this country. Um, a, as it happened, so yes. let, let's let's go back. You're, you're for a so little bit. right. It's one of those. Sometimes people ask me, you know, how did you start this, and and uh, or ask for advice for for publishing. I'm always like, I'm not sure we can really recreate the bizarre experience that I had. Mm -hmm. um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with the project, it actually started out as my thesis project um, for my master's at NYU in food studies. So it was like this really nerdy big project. Um, and because food studies is this very new field, it's only been, I think, 15 years. I would say at NYU, and I believe that's the oldest program. And it's a very, it's a very unique program. It doesn't exist in many places. Exactly, at all. exactly. And so, because it's so new and unique, um, there is no one specific way that you have to do your thesis. It's not like an anthropology degree where it's like you write this long paper in this very specific style. Um, and for me, what I'd been drawn to during the course of, of the degree. Um, Really, it just became clear that this was something that I could do and something that I was uniquely um, what, capable exactly? of contributing, which is to create a cookbook for people who are living on a food stamps budget. So let's just take a minute um, background on food stamps. Uh, they are <clears throat> a complicated issue um, in US politics, a very unique and, and at moments actually exciting story um, in this country of how they came to but they, it, the, the the process of food stamps, I think, over the years has been, um, or the, the history of them and, and their current status in America has changed a lot. And food oh, yeah. stamps, as people know, um, are, are uh, social welfare for people, obviously, who cannot um, afford to right. pay so for who has food, however. Below a certain threshold right. of income. But it takes a lot of work to prove that you are below that <laughs> yeah. threshold, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, even just doing the paperwork is right. extraordinary. It's, uh, it's, incredibly, it's incredibly difficult simply to sign up for them, let alone then to be able to. And so um, it's, the book, book is called Good and Cheap, not the Food Stamps Cookbook. It's called Eat Well on $4 a Day, because $4 a day is the average amount that you have to work with. So even after you manage to sign up, which is no easy feat, um, then suddenly you have approximately $4 a day to, to work with, which you know, is an incredible gift. Um, but at the same time, it's not like, oh, no problem then. Everything's going to be OK. Um, it's still extraordinarily difficult. Especially uh, in places all over the country where um, access to food Exactly, which is, was such an important topic, especially right. while I was at school, and, and continues to be um, a really important field of study that a lot of great minds are working on. And, and I see a lot of hope there. Um, but yeah, there's this focus on, you know, not everyone has even a place to go grocery shopping to spend your four dollars in an appropriate way. You know, there might be um, the place several miles away, um, and food security looks different in different places. Like the way that it looks in uh, New York City, sort of food insecurity might be. You know, urban insecurity means having to walk a half hour somewhere, um, having to take lousy public transit with heavy bags. In the rural countryside, it might mean only being able to afford gas to go you know, those five towns over once a month or something like mm -hmm. that. Um, so it looks very different in different places. Um, and, and I was studying all these big issues and becoming really frustrated by it and, and, and angry about it. And we'd have, you know, in grad school, you, ha you have all these amazing conversations with people and you have these intense conversations in class. And then at the end, you always come to this point where you're like, well, I don't know what we're going to do. We're screwed. That's usually what you end up. And I just got so tired of, of that experience and 
um, sort of knowing the struggles that we had ahead and knowing like how important they were and, and I, I never want to give up on those sort of large scale struggles. But I also was like desperate to just do something right now that could be of use, mm -hmm. um, that could be of immediate use, that you know certainly wasn't a response to the whole problem, but was the one thing that I was sort of good at, which was, was and is cooking. Um, I, I know, and as you know, Gail, and many people who work in food know, is the cost of basic food, basic foods are really, really inexpensive. Um, it's you, just a matter you, of if you know how to put them together. Right. You know, if you have those abilities that it's really just work. It's a practice, um, and if and so that was something that I really wanted to share, um, and I never in a million years imagined it would end up at this scale. I had hoped to be able to, to have it be of use to a few of the people that I worked with that I volunteered with. It's amazing that it has been as well received as it has. I think it just shows that. Um, that's something that a lot of people are excited about. And there was a hole that yeah. had, had been done before. It right. seems quite simple that we all, no matter I think at what income you're at um, and how much access to good food you have, you need to know what to do with it. And that's not, that's a complicated topic. That's why cookbooks right. exist exactly. in the first place. Um, but at the Even the best time, of us, sometimes sorry. you're just like, oh, I'm out of, I'm just, I don't know what to do today. Right, or you look at, uh, you look at a pantry of food and, and how do you make that into a meal? Moreover, how do you make it into a nutritious meal? But that's also delicious, and yes. I think that there, are, for Me so look many forward years, to right yeah. has been that those have been opposing, and I think that especially at the um, at the food stamp level and the level of people who need to get access the most, there has been a bit of a disconnect in the conversation between how do we make sure that we eat well and feed our families, but also eat food that we want to eat that yes. tastes good and that we feel empowered. Um, by eating. Yeah. So you're well, right. And it is something you look forward to right. because it's something that we all deserve. I mean, we all had this wonderful lunch and you guys get to have that every day. And that's something that can get you through a difficult day. And that should be available for absolutely everyone. Everyone deserves that type of right. comfort. That, is, that should be a right. Yes. It's not a privilege. So you're writing your thesis and you decide, I'm going to write a cookbook um, with recipes that fit in the food stamp budget. And then what happens? Because it took a turn <laughs> in a way that I think um, is worth sharing. Right. So after I graduated, this was December of 2013, I had kind of thought, OK, great. So I've done this. Now I need to get it out to people. And I initially thought this would be a great tool in the hands of some of the nonprofits that I'd worked with that I had volunteered with during my degree. Um, I was thinking of a lot of the families that I'd spoken with. You know, I'd just love to be able to, to give this to them. And so I started out there. I was sort of pitching it to different nonprofits. And people were interested in it, um, but no one was really sure. You know, at that point, it was just a PDF. I was kind of scrolling through it, showing them. They're like, oh, this is really nice. I'm not exactly sure how we'll use it. Um, and again, my impatience took over. And I just decided in uh, April of 2014 that I was just going to create a little website and put the book up there and kind of see what happened. I didn't really have a great plan. I wasn't like, well, I'm going to start pitching this to everyone. And you know, it, there was no real rhyme or reason. I was just like, I just want to put it out there. Did you tell and, anybody? And I'll figure it out. I Dan told knew. very Dan few people. Yeah, I told Dan. I told a few of my friends. I really didn't tell that many people, actually. And <laughs> so, which is why I was really surprised when one day at the end of April, just a few weeks after I'd made the website, I came home. And I opened up my computer. And I had hundreds of emails from my website. And at that point, it was the weirdest thing because like Dan had seen the website, and my father had seen the website. He had pretty much every day called to say like, Leanne, you've got some typos on there. Can you mm, please thank you, them? Dad? Oh, thanks, Dad. Um, but nobody else had. So I was like, what is going on? And it turned out that someone had posted it on Reddit, and it had become a very popular thread, and uh, and I was terrified, instantly terrified. It assumed the worst, of course. And, uh, and was thinking, like, oh my goodness, it's all these people probably criticizing and saying I'm an idiot. More and typos. Who knows? Yeah, it's, it's definitely typos. It's definitely. And it turned out that it was the opposite. It was so, all kinds of people saying. Um, I remember one of the first, first emails that I got that really struck me was this, this young man named Christian. He said, I am a student. I'm going back to school. I have to go on food stamps for the first time because I have to cut my hours back. And I was so terrified I was just going to be eating ramen because that's what everyone tells you. And, uh, and he said, oh, this just is such a relief to me. I'm really excited about this. And, uh, and there were hundreds more like that um, with, with similar stories and a lot of different stories. A lot of people were explaining about how 
the actual thing that really touched me was not just the people who are saying, this is helpful to me right now, which of course was tre tremendously validating, but was that people were sharing stories about experiences they'd had in their past, like growing up with hunger, talking about, you know, my grandparents who looked, at, looked after us um, did a great job. They, you know, we ate really well, but I remember our neighbors had a really tough time, and I wish they'd had something like this. People were sharing stuff like that. It was so incredible. And people were creating this little community, sort of saying like, all right, well, let's help Leanne out. Like, how can we get this out there? And I was like, yeah, guys, what do you think? How can we get this out there? I don't know what I'm doing. Um, and so that was really um, exciting. And after Reddit, it sort of spread to a few different parts of the internet. And I realized that, you know, I just needed to have courage. I needed to stop like being a wimp, kind of just telling Dan, just telling my dad about these things. I needed to go for it. Um, so we decided mean? that meant launching a Kickstarter to fund an actual print run. Because, of course, the one very legitimate criticism that people have was like, it's great that it's online. And it's very easy to give things away for free on the internet, but it's not uh, that easy to give things away for free when they're, they're physical. And so I just had not, I knew that we wanted to make physical cookbooks, but I just didn't really know how. And so with all this encouragement from all these wonderful strangers, I was like, okay, maybe we can raise some money. Um, so we decided to do a Kickstarter campaign, um, stole the Tom Shoes model, the buy one, give one, because um, it was very important that this not sort of just be a cookbook. It was very important that it remain totally free and as accessible as possible for people who, for whom it would really be a genuine burden to pay $20 for a cookbook. Like that's, um, I just didn't want to put up that kind of barrier. So luckily, you know, Kickstarter exists. You can kind of do what you need to do. Ask, just put it out there, ask people for this. So we launched the campaign, we asked for $10,000, and uh, we figured with that, Dan helped with these calculations, um, that we could print about 1,000 books total, 500 we'd be able to give away, 500 we'd give to our backers, and then we could sort of break even and get by and it would be okay. But we reached that goal in the first 36 hours of the campaign, <laughs> so it's like a day and a half later. It was unbelievable. And I have to say, just because I am here at Google, that a lot of the um, Dan's colleagues and, and even people that he'd never met before were incredible in those first few days. So supportive. Everyone was so excited. And, uh, and I think really lent some great momentum to the project. And so then by the end of the campaign, we had over $144,000. Um, Which translates to how many books? <laughs> 40,000 books. 40,000 books. Yeah. Just to put that in perspective. <laughs> Um, and, and the people at Workman can certainly um, oh my God. fill in the blanks uh, about this, but a first run of a cookbook by someone relatively unknown at Completely. the time. Yeah. Now Leanne Brown will be in the history books. Um, <laughs> uh, is sort of unprecedented. Who, who publishes a 40,000 book run, right? That is, that, I mean, granted you were giving a lot of them away, but that, that is um, by any measure, an extraordinary feat, let alone one that That's you amazing. knew most of which was going to uh, be given away. As right, a a, a, right. A, a well, and that was what was venture. kind of exciting about as we began, as we were making more and more money, we knew that we were going to be able to give more away. That was kind of what we had said. Um, when I made my little video, I said, you know, the more we raise, the more we can give away, and we really wanted to do that. So we developed, um, in the end, the breakdown was uh, 7,000 went to our Kickstarter backers. 9,000 we, we donated through hundreds of different nonprofits across the country, and I can talk a little more, more about that later. Um, and then the balance we had, so we had 24,000 left, and we wanted to give away as many as possible, but it was really, you know, it's expensive to just like purely donate those things. And so what we figured was we could still get more into people's hands if we asked people to pay just a little bit for them. So we asked the same nonprofits, would you guys be interested in purchasing these at cost? about $4 a book, and we got an incredible outpouring of interest there as well. And so the balance was 24000 we sold at $4 each to those same nonprofits. We worked with about 600 different nonprofits across the country, and they were talking about, obviously, you know, food banks and food pantries, um, a lot of schools and daycare programs, senior centers, lots of farmers markets, mm -hmm. um, a lot of different um, healthcare organizations, even some... Um, health insurance plans were interested in. It was fascinating, the sort of groups of people who I had never thought about being interested in this, who were saying, this is such an important issue for my clients. Um, you know, people that I never really thought about. I think that that uh, brings up a point, if I can take a slight um, serious turn. Um, uh, the, si the scale of 
the issue of hunger in America. Um, your book says this, um, 40 million, 46 million 46 people million. in this country um, know hunger, go, go to sleep. Right now. Don't, don't know right now. Or what's ca uh, yeah. called food insecure, so don't know where their next meal will be from. Um, and I think 15% of the population. Right. Yeah. By the way, side note, we're from Canada. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, n by far not a perfect country, but a much smaller country by population. 46 million hungry people in this country. There are only 35 million people in Canada. Full stop. Yeah. Um, and that's, I mean, that was a huge thing when I was in grad school. Just that, thinking about that. It's difficult to actually wrap your mind around. And knowing that the face of hunger, that sounds like a weird poster that should right. go on the <laughs> subway. But, um, Probably is. but that you don't know what it looks like. That it, in it, and to your point, it's the so diverse. The people yes. that we talked about, and the and the places that you were um, being contacted by, were incredibly diverse and from yes. you know the cor corners of of our population that you would never imagine. Absolutely, I think there's definitely. I mean, we all know that there's so many stereotypes about people who are are living with hunger, people who are on food stamps, but there. It's 15% of the population. They're as diverse as the rest of the country. And um, the stories are really incredible and really moving and really important. And that's actually something about this project that I, I probably should have expected, but I never expected sort of to be as, um, as intense and as moving. I, I hear from people daily who will share things. I get a lot of letters that start with, I've never shared this story with anyone before. Um, and I'm, I'm so honored that they, that people are willing to, that people trust me, that see me as someone who can understand their story. That is probably really difficult to tell. Um, but I also, I feel an intense need to tell that story, those stories too, and, and a real desire to make, uh, to in, in small ways try to make the world a little bit safer so that people can feel more comfortable sharing those stories as well. And especially to the people that they work with and, and their family and their friends because you know, we're talking about 15% of the population who's dealing with this right now. Think about over the course of your life. We all know someone, or, or even many people who've dealt with these issues. And it's a very hidden problem, and it, and it shouldn't be, because shame festers in places where there's no light, you know, when we don't talk to, to people about and these things. And it becomes in itself a, a, a cycle. Yes. Um, it, being able to eat with integrity, I think about a lot, and um, and I think this is a viable tool for by which people can do so. It yes, I mean I hope that it can be it can be useful for a lot of people. It's certainly not going to work for everyone, um, and and I wouldn't imagine you know there's no tool I think that can work for absolutely everyone. But I hope that this is of use. Um, I know that it's of use to to a lot of people. So tell us where you are now with the book. You gave away and sold those first 40,000, right. um, and then? Well, and then it was during the Kickstarter that I heard from a few different publishers, which was really surprising to me at first, and not because I thought, well, I'm the best. Dan and I are brilliant <laughs> at publishing. We just want to do this on our own. It was just that we never thought that any publisher would want to help us give away cookbooks. Like that's, They're in the business of the opposite of that. Um, so we just I just never looked for, for a publisher. And, uh, and so I ended up meeting up with the incredible people at Workman Publishing, um, many of whom are here today to support, um, to support me. And um, they said, we love your cookbook, but we, and we want to help you take this project further. We love the giveaway idea. Um, this is what we're all about, and we want to help you take it further. I was like, yes, please. Um, not only because, obviously, that's just a good idea, but also because we had just managed to distribute 40,000 books and never wanted to do that again. Um, actually, it was before From all that happened. Apartment. I was just terrified about it. At that point, I was just like, oh. Um, but doing it with a publisher will give you an enormous Let amount of Let the people who know what they're doing do their thing. Yes, yes. <laughs> there That's are experts out there. Yes. Um, so it's been incredible. Um, so what we did was we created a second edition of the cookbook. So that gave me the opportunity to kind of look at, at the book again because you know it had sort of melded out of this thesis and then some other information and then I'd added some new recipes through the Kickstarter, gotten some cool stories from people that had written to me um, 
I had been able to improve it a little bit, but this is another opportunity to, to fill in a lot more of the holes, um, address some of the things that people said, we actually like this, like all the information about how to, um, how to shop, like how to really, like what are some strategies for what you should have in your kitchen and how you can get food on the table quickly, all these kinds of things. That tends to be the part of the cookbook that I personally skip. So I was like, oh, people aren't that into this. Um, it turned out that people were incredibly interested in that information, and so I added a lot more of that. Um, and yeah, I think we really improved it, and so that's what came out this past July. And uh, and for everyone that sold, you know, in not just on my little website where people had to go to get it before, but now in bookstores everywhere, online, everywhere, um, we are donating one uh, one for one for every single one. And um, that's going to be as long as it's... distribute the, the ones that are given away? Right. So we have, that's the other exciting thing. We have, with a publisher, we had even more opportunity for partnerships. So our giveaway partner is located in Cincinnati. They're called Access Wireless. And they, um, they warehouse all the books and they send them out um, to the different nonprofits and to um, the Feeding America food bank system, as well as to a lot of their clients. So Access Wireless is a... Um, a provider of the government-funded Lifeline program, which has been around since the 80s. And the idea behind it when it started was that no one should ever have to choose between paying for food or paying for a phone. And so and in the 80s, let's remember what phones looked like. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> they were held with a briefcase, I think. You, none of you are old enough shoulder pen. to remember that, yep. but I remember that. We balanced it in your neck on your shoulder pad. Yeah, that's right. how, <laughs> how you do it. And uh, so it's a basically a free phone or phone plan for uh, people who can't afford it. And so the so Access Wireless clients are pretty much exactly the people that we really that I really want to reach with um, that we really want to reach with good and cheap. And they're also partnered with a huge grocery store uh, chain Kroger. And so they they did all this work uh, often in grocery store parking lots sort of saying, "Hey, you know, you might qualify for this phone." And so they were hearing all the time from people about what was their number one issue. It was food security. It was, it was being um, afraid about where the next meal was going to come from, um, how they're going to feed their family well, all these kinds of things. And so it was something that had become really important to them. And so they reached out to me um, during the Kickstarter as well and said, we might like to get several thousand books. And I was like, oh, I don't know if we have those for you. But Workman um, does. Yeah, but Workman does, and now they're an incredible partner, and we're so lucky like that they, they're willing to do this for us, and they make everything. Um, they're able to sort of lean on their partnerships to make this more powerful, and I just feel so honored to have them involved with it. Do you have a gauge at this point of how many books you've given away in total? <sighs> Dan, do you know the numbers at this point? 20,000. 20,000 yeah. books have been given away. Yeah, through this this version. Yeah. This version and the yeah. other 20,000 from the last version. Yes. So 40,000 books have been given away. So I think more or less. Yeah, Let's it's, just say yeah, yes. Yeah, it's all very There's a lot of I them know out it's there. more complicated, yeah. Yeah. but, but <laughs> well, let's go with that. Yeah. That that is an extraordinary amount of people who've been very cool through your book. Yeah. So let's talk about the what's inside this okay. book. Okay. For a second, because um, I've ha been able to spend some time with it, I got a copy in July, and um, have been drooling over it and thinking <laughs> about it and reading it. And um, there is and a lot I hope of. You guys got to eat a little bit, a few of the the things that yes. your wonderful Today chefs the prepared. Yeah. Um, there, there's a lot of really great information here, and I think I should note applicable to everyone. Yeah. Um, on how to shop, on how to cook. Um, and, and there's a few really important lessons at the front. So let's talk about all that stuff for a second sure, that you yes. thought wasn't that important. Which yeah. I think <laughs> is really um, strategies for eating well. Yeah. What are some of the things that you hope are, what, what are some of the strategies that you hope people will take away when they read this book? Simple strategies people can employ in their kitchens every day or in their daily lives. Well, so I think the key, one of the key things is just don't be scared. It's going to be totally OK. There's almost no way that you can really, really screw up as badly as you can imagine you can. Um, so first off, relax. I mean, if you've never done this before, you can do it. Um, and then the other thing is really so much of eating well on a really strict budget is making sure that you just eat everything that you buy and use it to sort of its fullest extent. And so that you're, you try to purchase as many things that have multiple uses as possible. Like no single. You know, just like in so many areas of our lives, 
if you purchase something that you can only, only have one use for, it's only going to be useful in that one way. So things like um, pancake mix, it's not that useful except to make pancakes. Like you can make pancakes, great. You cannot do anything else with it. If you buy flour, if you buy baking soda, suddenly there's a million things that you can bake. You know, and so those, those sorts of, of rules are very important. Actually, we just switched the slide to the peanut butter and jelly granola bars. Yum. So oatmeal is a huge, is, I have this big section on oatmeal because, well, oatmeal is really inexpensive. It's super filling. It's fantastic. Um, Fiber. It's something that's right next to the cereal, and it's like an eighth the price, and you can make it flavored any way you like. Um, and it's something that we, we sort of tend to have a lot of. And so this is these peanut butter and jelly granola bars are basically taking three things that we almost all have in our cupboard, or if we don't have them in our cupboard, you know, they're, they're going to be in a food pantry. You're probably going to be able to get your hands on oats and peanut butter and jelly. And of course, we've all eaten oatmeal. We've all had peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. <laughs> and uh, this is a way to sort of transform those things into something completely different. And so all what's in a granola bar. It's basically just oats and some stuff to make it stick together. And so why shouldn't that be peanut butter and jelly? And that's, that's really all that this is. And so this is an extremely flexible recipe, sort of taking some basics that you have around and not being afraid to kind of smush them together and make them into something different. And, um, and it's, again, it's extremely flexible. You can add, you know, if you have other things in the, in the pantry, if you have some coconut, if you have some leftover almonds, you know, the bottom of that um, bag of cereal that's really dusty and you don't really want to eat it with your milk, uh, you can throw that in here and, and make Love it really that. great. And so I think this recipe is sort of a good example of, of Go something. Go back to it for one second. Sorry, I wanted to point out one other thing. Of something that is just, it's really about sort of, fle so flexibility, like being comfortable um, in your kitchen and sort of going for it. It has to do with having a little bit of courage and, and also just being confident and using every last little bit of everything. Tell us uh, about the information in the top left-hand corner. Oh, right. The right -hand corner. Yes. Left -hand corner. So that is the cost. Um, the cost, and that. Ooh, I don't know if you want me to get too nerdy about exactly how those. If you're going to get from. nerdy anywhere, you're going to do it at Google. Right? Okay. Here we go. All right. So I mean that in the best way. It's a good point. It's a good point. So the cost came from. Uh, I, I basically took one neighborhood in New York City, um, Inwood, and I went to all the grocery stores. And I had a huge list of all the sort of basic pantry items, like from sort of every, you know, we had sort of your basic fruits and vegetables. We had um, stuff from every category. It's a pretty, pretty significant list. And, um, and I took down the prices of all of those items at all the different grocery stores. And then I sort of averaged them out across. And it was even ridiculous. Like, what do you say the price of potatoes is at a given grocery store? Because there's like 20 kinds of potatoes, and they come in different bags and all these kinds of things. So it's very much an average cost of all, of all of those items. Um, and I made that into spreadsheets and ended up ultimately costing everything out. And so that's where that comes from. Because, and, and the reason that I wanted to do that was because initially this, this book actually sort of started out as a critique of the food stamps uh, system that we sort of take the average costs of food across the country and, and make decisions based on that when uh, the cost of food varies so wildly by, by city, by region, by neighborhood. Um, and so I, I sort of felt like this could be a useful little thing for New York City, which is another reason why when it first ended up getting out on Reddit, I was like, oh my god, this might not be helpful or work anywhere else. Um, but I realized that um, a lot of these same uh, that it was important not to sort of baby people and sort of say, like, here's an exact replica of something that you can do, you know, now do this, but to introduce large scale or concepts of, of how to shop. You know, how can you sort of get the best value? How can you um, eat more seasonally so that you can enjoy good variety in your diet that is still reasonably priced? These sorts of things. And so the, the book kind of morphed in, into that with time. And tell us about some of the recipes. <laughs> so, so we have uh, the vegetable quiche here as well, which is another example. I guess flexibility is probably like the number one thing. And um, that's because when you have very little money, you need to be able to take advantage of things like sales or things like what you happen to have available. You need to be confident to look into your vegetable crisper and go like, ugh, those things are going off. 
how can I make something good out of that? And so as many of the recipes as, as possible really kind of take that into account. And, and so the quiche for me is really one of those things that at the end of the week when, uh, when you're looking at your, um, your produce and you're thinking, Ugh, this isn't looking very good anymore. What am I going to do? I definitely don't want to make a salad out of this wilty stuff. This is a really great way to bring those things back to life so that you're using them all up. And it's one of the simplest tips. I almost feel ridiculous saying, but like when people ask, I'll always say, don't go to the grocery store until you look in the fridge and just see what you have in there, like especially um, in, your, in your vegetable crisper. Like just make sure that you've emptied it out before you start putting other stuff on top of that. Um, and so this is a great way to do that. And it uses eggs, which are, again, one of the, like, for me, just key things to always have, um, always have with you because you can have food on the table so quickly. Um, I actually noticed in the beginning of the book, and I'm excited about this, that you, talk, you spend a lot of time talking about eggs. I'm a big egg lover myself. They're transformative. They're so exciting. Like, they doesn't are. this look amazing? The most versatile ingredient, I think, known to man. I think so. Um, or, and other. So species. far, yes. Um, right? <laughs> but, um, uh, and so tell us, uh, a little about that because I think eggs appear and reappear in, in so many different ways in this book and uh, and people I mean that's such a great example of right so we want to have so one of the other things like the ways that you can it's just like efficiency of, of it's economic it's basic economics if you buy a few things and you can use them a bunch of different ways it's going to be way more efficient and so eggs are one of those um, those items, of course, you can have them really quickly scrambled, but you can create these dishes that actually feel really fancy and really special, kind of out of the scraps and, and bits and pieces, and make something that you know you would have at a beautiful restaurant with ladies who lunch. Mm -hmm. And um, that is the magic and the power and the beauty of cooking. Yeah. Um, and so, and, and the egg is just one of those those items that uh, you can. The, so the other really big thing is is using leftover as well. Um, so we'll often make like a larger amount of something. And um, uh, and so you, the next day, I don't know about you, Gail, but I tend to be sort of not as excited about leftovers oh, the next no. day. I'm actually very suspicious of people who don't like leftovers. Well, I, Sorry, I'm, I'm happy with We're them. We're going to agree to disagree on this one. I'm happy with them, but I have to like do something different Fine. to them. Um, and so allow. sometimes that just I'll means, allow you that. That just sometimes means putting an egg on top. Yeah. We have a saying at the food and wine right. offices. Everything is better with yeah. that. <laughs> right. Drooling out. Yeah. Yes. Um, and there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of great information about eggs. And I could talk about eggs all day. But there's a lot of simple, uh, simple examples like eggs that I think become so handy. Yogurt is one of them. I, I love the, uh, the, your, your discussion about yogurt um, because I think it's something that people don't think about a lot. Totally. And that actually came almost directly out of uh, this work that I did during, uh, during my degree. I, I got to do grocery store tours with a lot of families who are um, part of the WIC program. And we would so often... WIC is... Uh, oh, sorry, yes, the, the Women with Infant Children program. So it's, um, it's special uh, food vouchers, basically, of, of foods that are specifically good for women who are pregnant with children up to the age of five. Subsidy, it's yes. subsidies on, to, on the as part of the bigger... Exactly. And so there's a big dairy component, actually. And often, and that became really interesting because, of course, some people are lactose intolerant. It was always like, okay, how do you use this? Um, but we'd always have such a fascinating discussion at the dairy case. And everyone would say, oh, I love yogurt. I love giving these yogurts to my kids. And it was usually those tiny little ones, you know, that are... Um, full, unfortunately, full of sugar um, and you know, almost as bad for you as an ice cream a lot of the time. And as I was sort of having to deliver this sort of bad news, I was like, how can I <laughs> like, soften the blow here? And because uh, yogurt is a really, really nutritious and fantastic um, ingredient. It's just that it's really good when it's like the good plain yogurt. It, these like little fancified little mini whatevers are, um, are not so hot for you. And so I would always be trying to explain, like, the, uh, buy the large tub of yogurt. Not only can you make your own flavors at home, if you like. You know, you can throw in some blueberries, some, a s tablespoon of jam, whatever you like. As seen um, on page. Yeah, you can make your own key lime pie version at home. It's not that difficult. Um, but or also... Or. Uh, also, it becomes then an ingredient, too. It's something I would always love explaining, you know, Greek yogurt is really just strained regular yogurt, and that's something you can do. Um, you can make all kinds of savory sauces, make raita. Um, there's, Dips, using yeah, baking, tzatziki. Subsida, using exactly. a, a substitution. Right, and that's why, you know, there's a, quite a few, I think, I have a muffin, the zucchini muffins recipe uses yogurt, and um, just yogurt is an item that you should have in the fridge. 
and, uh, and so I tried to design as many of the recipes as possible um, that use those sort of really basic things that you might use for a snack, but then you can use them in different ways. Um, so, yeah. What's your favorite recipe in the book? If you had to make something every day, what would you make? What's the recipe you love the most? It's the chana masala, um, which is a chickpea curry. And that's because when I was in university, um, I was totally obsessed with Indian food. Um, I absolutely loved it. And it really took me a long time to figure out how to make it myself. And I had a ton of trial and error and just failed miserably many, many times. But because I loved it so much, I continued to try to make it. And we had, uh, my friends and I had this one uh, coffee shop in, uh, that, that we would always hang out at. And it was a coffee shop that also had uh, all kinds of Pakistani food, which is a sort of strange combination, but it was awesome. Um, and they had this, cha they had chana masala, and we were totally obsessed with it, and so I had to figure out how to make it. And when I finally did, and I figured it out, and it's really not that difficult, it's just that you need to sort of toast the spices and layer the flavors, and I finally figured that out. And I was just so excited to share this with my friends. And it's also something that takes only about 20 minutes to put together, and it so transforms just regular old chickpeas into this like most unctuous, most like incredibly comforting, beautiful dish. And, and it um, costs what? And it costs, I think it's like $3 for, for that amount. It's so cheap and so, which is of course amazing because we were all students and had no money and you know we would spend our money at this coffee shop, but it would be a lot better if we could make it at home. And it was one of the first times I really had that satisfying feeling of sharing um, a recipe with people and having people say, I made that, you know, and I really loved it. And my friends will still tell me to this day that that's comfort food that they make for themselves on, the ra on a regular basis. And to me, that's like just so amazing and like such an honor to be in someone's home uh, in, a, in a small way by giving them a recipe. So we're all making chana masala, right? <laughs> I am. Um, before we take some questions from the audience, uh, last thing, what is next for good and cheap? If you could have your well, way and do whatever and take it well, to the next level, what would it be? Oh my gosh, for good and cheap. Well, I, so we're going to keep going. Um, I think there's incredible partnership possibilities available. Um, but my big focus, and I don't know exactly how I'm going to do this, but is to share the stories that people have been sharing with me in some way, um, in a way that will um, that really honors them and uh, and that will make people want to read them and pay attention to them as well. And so I'm not sure how that project will work, whether it'll be you know a podcast or a video series. Um, but I, I, I think that's a really important um, component of this because uh, it's not just about the food, but it's about like the people who, who are making this food. And, and I feel like I have a responsibility to do that. So that then there's a part B to this question. I'm going kick to kick off. I'm getting kicked off the stage. Um, how can we help? Oh my goodness. Um, well, I guess tell tell people about this stuff. Cook. Um, Buy the book. <laughs> learn more about the food stamps program. Um, vote for people who you think actually care about these issues and are not going to continue to defund them. Very, very, very important. And uh, you can find out who those people are pretty easily. Actually, pretty easily. There's a. Now I'm forgetting the name of it. There's a website that just launched. OK, I'm going to get back to you on that. But that rates the Congress people in your constituency um, on issues surrounding Ooh. the Farm Bill and, and mm -hmm. um, Child Nutrition Act. So this, in the biggest way, I think, is a, is a policy issue. But Three. we all have voices, and we all can improve the health of our communities by cooking good and cheap. Yeah, exactly. I guess, yeah, just be confident in your own lives and know that cooking is not something that's only for experts. It's something that absolutely all of us can do and get a lot of enjoyment out, out of um, and improve our lives in just small ways. Thank you so, so much. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Do we have time for questions? OK, wonderful. And Dan, do you want to switch just to the, could, could we switch to the slide that oh, shows the map? The map? I just want to show that off because it's my most favorite thing. Um, so this map shows all of the different nonprofits that we've worked with to date. Um, and if you want to see that in a much more detailed way, you can go to leannebrown.com slash impact. And you can scroll down and see all of the different, the names of all of the different places that we've worked with. Because if you're not from New York and you want to see sort of where in your hometown we've worked with, you can check that out.
you had a lot of uh, really good ideas in it. Um, but I noticed earlier you made a quip like, oh, people think when they're going on food stamps, all they're going to be able to eat is ramen. Right. And that's not really true. Would you say it's more accurate that if someone's going on food stamps, they're going to be eating a lot less meat? And if that is accurate, do you think that would be a cultural shift for your average food stamp recipient? So I don't think there is an average food stamp recipient. So that's sort of, that's not something uh, that I sort of feel totally comfortable going with. But uh, definitely, I think it's naturally much cheaper to eat less meat. Um, and you'll notice in the book, you know, it's not a vegetarian book, but there isn't that much meat in it. And that's just for practical reasons. And because um, if you use meat in, in sort of more as a flavoring rather than as the center of the dish, um, you can still have it in your, as a part of your diet without it sort of taking over. I think the fact is that a lot of people who are, who are very used to eating meat who maybe are having to, say, have had something happen in their life that has made it so that they um, are having a change, um, having to go on food stamps, say, for the first time, that yes, you might sort of start out buying your regular um, amount of meat and maybe discover that as a result you don't have enough left over to, to eat enough. Um, so that would probably be a shift. Um, but there are so many cultures <laughs> that uh, meat is not half the plate. It's usually like one fifteenth the plate. It's just sort of a part of the dish. <laughs> And so it's something that's actually pretty unique in the world that we eat the amount of meat that we do. And I don't think it's as, I think it's, it's not about sort of thinking, oh man, I don't have any meat anymore. It's about replacing that with stuff that you're excited about and giving it a try. And then hopefully realizing that um, the food that you're getting to eat is just as satisfying and just as interesting. And for me, um, fruits and vegetables are actually a lot more exciting and hold a lot more um, potential of interesting flavor than, than meat really does. And so when you create menus and, and food with fruits and vegetables as the organizing principle, I think you're going to be really excited by it. And from a health standpoint, better off. Yeah. Most likely too, right? Yeah, we all need to eat. We all know we need well, to eat more right. fruits and vegetables. Protein like, done. is not the same thing as meat. No. So, so Eggs are protein. Right. Well, and you know, if you're <laughs> and right. fat, yes. And delicious. beans are protein, and there's a lot of ways to get great protein without focusing on meat. I think. Yep. Is it, and you discuss that a lot in the Definitely. book, actually. Hey, Eric. You had any, hey, <laughs> any thoughts on how the food industry can help meet these goals as well, changes they can make? For instance, Ooh. I know that sometimes people who are low on money are also low on time, and cooking from scratch takes time. Yes. I'm a big Trader Joe's fan, not for the prepared food, because they kind of like take a whole butternut squash and cut it into little cubes for Yeah, them. yeah, yeah. Do you have any other thoughts that have come up in your work around how the industry can help meet you halfway in getting people to do more? Hmm. Well, I like, I mean, I, th I think that's a great point that you bring up. Um, it would be awesome... I really like that as well, like those sorts of um, taking sort of basic foods and just half preparing them, not going the full way where you're, you know, getting your frozen samosas, but, but the like cubed butternut squash. Um, the problem is often that those also come with a, a cost increase, right? Because it's like the bags of spinach that are pre-washed and beautiful, they're double the price of the bunch of spinach. And I mean, that's one of those basic tips is usually, you know, the more work you have to do with it, to it, the, the cheaper it's going to be. Um, but if there is a way to sort of to, to use scale to make it so that those are, are more accessible, then absolutely. I think, um, Gail, do you want to talk about the, um, the grocery store that you were Oh, sure. About? Yeah. I think that would be. Uh, uh, quickly, there was a man um, who worked at Trader Joe's for 30 years, and he was the president by the time he left. Um, and he left a few years ago to start, an organi uh, to start a company called The Daily Table, dailytable.org. You can read about it. And what he's basically done, and right now it's sort of in beta in Massachusetts, in Dorchester, Massachusetts. Um, it is a grocery store that takes in all of the almost at the point of not being able to sell produce um, and perishable food from grocery stores and, and retailers across the country and brings it to their store. So they're... Their shelves are constantly being turned over, and they buy smaller amounts. But of stuff that maybe in two days from now, a big grocery chain wouldn't be able to sell, and sells it at deep, deep discounts. In and they open in food deserts. They open in in, in uh, communities that don't have access to other grocery stores. And so that that thinking, that idea, I think, and I, I have every um, ounce of confidence that this model will really take off, and he'll be able to build a chain across the country of it because it's it's extraordinary but it has allowed um 
people on, on limited budgets of any kind to yeah. have access to fresh fruits and vegetables in a way that they never have before. Because the other piece of the puzzle that we've all sort of skirted around and talked about that's so connected, and there's so many sides to this, um, is, is food waste. And that's also part of the problem, that we as a nation are wasting 30% of the food that we produce. Right. And that has to change in order right. for costs to come down as well. Right. Well, I mean, that's actually why the food stamps program was initially sort of came to be. It's right. actually because of the crisis of we have so much food or um, in America, there is so much food available, but it's not going to, the, to where it's And that's needed. still the and issue. That the issue, issue is not that there isn't enough food in this country. The issue it's is a distribution. It's a distribution issue, exactly. Yeah. And it's a, a government subsidy issue to some extent as well. Yeah. Thank you guys again for coming. This has been really great. Um, I have a question about what happened once you started gaining momentum and sort of popularity. Did other you know, experts or people working in this space try to jump in on your cookbook and get their recipes or their ideas <laughs> involved? Um, not really. I mean, I had a tremendous amounts of encouragement from other people. Um, I wouldn't say there weren't, yeah, I mean, people send me recipes sometimes or will say, hey, you're missing this, you should have this. Um, but I, you know, I have to sort of take that with a grain of salt and go like, well, what is my wider goal? Um, but no, I, people were incredibly kind to me, actually, I think, um, because I think this issue is really, really important to everyone. And so, uh, yeah, people were just tremendously encouraging, to be honest. I'm surprised. Yeah, <laughs> I know, it's very cool, have right? faith in humanity. Yeah. <laughs> Gave me so much faith in humanity, actually, overall, like, not just um, experts, but just, I mean, the Kickstarter itself, just that there were so many people who, people care about this issue enormously, but we all, I think, feel, and I, mean, I frequently feel, um, like, unsure in the face of it. It's such a big problem. Like, Overwhelmed by it's how like, we can actually do anything as individuals. Exactly, that's, and, and, and in a way, like, we can't do a lot as individuals, and that's, like, a fact. Like, it's large policy shifts that will make an impact, but we want to help with these things. And so I think supporting the Kickstarter, sort of being able to um, to get this book out to some more people, being able to sort of point to this as, as some type of evidence, as some sort of piece of hope, meant a lot to a lot of people. And they were willing to, you know, put their money behind it and put their confidence behind it and let more people know so that it spread. And to me, that just shows just awesome things. Well, it's empowering. It's empowering for people like us who um, want to help but don't know how. And I think it's empowering to the people who this book was originally conceived for because it gives them a tool that they'd otherwise not have. Right. And it gives us all a voice and, and makes us more aware of an issue that, um, that we wouldn't otherwise have the um, information and, and channel to learn about. So yeah. you are inspiring us all. <laughs> no, in truth, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Uh, one more question? Any, yeah. Hi, thanks for coming again. Um, I was just wondering if you had a specific audience in mind when you were writing the cookbook, more specifically whether it was for singles or for people supporting families, because um, as a single person, I find it difficult to go grocery shopping and difficult to cook for one totally. person. Either you're cooking a lot of the same thing mm -hmm. and it gets boring or things tend to go bad quicker because you're not consuming it fast enough. Yeah, totally. So <laughs> great question, actually. Um, so, so many cookbooks are really designed for people with families, um, which is important, I think, because it's a, it's a big issue, um, and it, I think, becomes a more, it feels more acute. It's like, oh my gosh, I have all these people to feed. <laughs> um, but uh, I really wanted for everyone with every kind of family size, with all kinds of backgrounds, to be able to recognize something of themselves in this. And so I didn't, I really tried to make it as open as possible, and I actually thought a lot about single people, um, not just because, um, because I feel like they're less, uh, they're less catered to, which is very important, um, but because it's so difficult when you have very little, like you cannot take advantage of a lot of the sort of scale things that can help if you have a larger family. And so I felt like that was, you know, it can feel very demoralizing to, to sometimes to cook for one or to, to eat the same thing over and over again. That's one of the reasons I have a lot of, here's how to use up leftovers, here's how to kind of create a few different things that are the same basic five things over and over. Um, I have a lot of, of that kind of information because I, I think that's a big deal. I have the, the stuff on toast section <laughs> is like, that's what I eat when Dan's away or when I'm just on my own or when he stays late and eats at Google all the time. Um, <laughs> you know, like that's those are, right. You know, like that's, um, 
the, the stuff on toast is sort of, and, and I've heard from a lot of people who are also single who said, oh my gosh, thank you for like giving me permission to have this be a meal. I think that's, sometimes we get so stuck in, that's actually a big thing is we can eat whatever we want at any time of day. It doesn't matter. Like that's one of the awesome things about cooking. You do not have to have a meat with two vegetables and that's your dinner. Otherwise, you're not doing it right. There's so many different things that we can eat. And, uh, and I think sometimes, you just need a little nudge and a reminder that that's totally OK. And so long as you're enjoying it, that hopefully you're eating a reasonable number of fruits and vegetables, you're fine. Um, and so, and sometimes that means eating really, really simply. Uh, so I try to design it very much to have people from all walks of life be able to recognize themselves. And that means, to some extent, that it's not for any one group of people. And so I w I'm always shocked when people say, oh, I use, I." I've tried every single thing in the book. Like I'm like, really? Because I sort of think that people will take it and go like, okay, there's five recipes in here that I really like, whatever. Um, but I can't remember where I was going with this. But ultimately, uh, there's something I, for I, everyone. There's, I hope there's something for everyone. And I get really excited when I, I met with uh, a few weeks ago. I had someone come up at a, another event I was doing and said, you know, the roti, uh, the roti in here is something like that we've made as a family because um, we're from the Caribbean and like we've made it for years and that made us feel like so excited about this book that this was something that we made in our home and so maybe there were some other ideas and I think that's just like a very natural response is if you see something you're like hey I know what that is I like that it makes you trust and be interested in the rest of the book and so I just wanted it to be like as inviting as possible inclusive I think that's all we have time for today. Thanks for joining us on your yeah, lunch. I know thanks, that guys. Um, everyone has a busy day. Let you get back to work. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>